I've been stoned, you know, not stoned, but literally like the Bible being stoned. Um, I've been attacked with a bullwhip, uh, shot at. That was bad. Yeah. Uh, it I was think hard. you should have a section on that. Captured as a hostage and held for ransom until we escaped. Today it's going to be mostly about bones and maybe we'll get a little bit of plants going. Hi, my name is Mark Aldendurfer. I'm an archaeologist. I've been doing archaeology now for more than 40 years. Uh, at first as a graduate student, then as a professional, and you know, one job after another. I knew I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was in, I'm going to say third grade, but more likely fifth grade. The teacher would give us, say, what are you going to be, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so we would all sit down and write what we'd like, and then we'd all put this in a story so that every kid would then say what they wanted to be. So I was the only one who ever said they wanted to be an archaeologist, and, you know, it turned out to be exactly right. The thing that's really driven my career now for the last 25 years or so has been thinking about how lowlanders become highlanders. I mean, that's really the, the fundamental here because none of us, well, none of us ever evolved that way. So we, we, we achieved the adaptations and the genetic, um, you know, the genetic capacity to live at high elevation. And so the question is, how'd that happen? There are three major populations that live on the planet that have adapted to life at high elevation. Some in the Andes, some in the Himalayas and Tibetan Plateau, and then Ethiopian Plateau. And when you look at them, they, they share similarities, but also significant differences in the way in which they, either their genes are, you know, what the composition of their genes are like, as well as the kind of the behavioral and physiological responses they have to high elevation. So although they've all converged on a solution, that is, they all find, have found a way to live at high elevation, the genetics are really quite fascinatingly different. We've been working in Nepal now for about 10 years. Um, the, the main focus was at a site called Samzong. The question is, where did they come from? And so what this project has really been all about is to try to understand when the peopling of the high Himalayas took place, which direction it came from, what were the conditions under which that took place, and so on. So the, it's pretty clear that Mustang had some connections to the world, and they used those connections in a variety of ways to get things like the silks, to get the gold for the gold masks. It looks isolated in nowhere, but in fact Mustang is really was, was connected. You know, I learned in the Andes that doing the, just, just the archaeology just doesn't, it's just not enough. The thing that was going to make this project work was getting people that could actually do the, the genetic analysis of, of the human remains. You know, we have samples of human teeth of one kind or another. Then, you know, again, we have samples that have already been set off for the, for the DNA research. I mean, my contribution is really on the genetics end. So when Mark and I first met, he had a lot of really interesting questions about the, pop the, peop like the population history of this region and how the Himalayas were first colonized. You know, one thing Mark and I had talked about was how useful it would be to have genetic data. I mean, basically, he'd gone as far as he could using every other technique. Really, for the particular questions that he was interested in and I became interested in, it was clear genetics was the way to go but I'd never been to this part of the world before, and I'd never been so much so remote in my entire life. So we got to the site and set up a kind of, mo I set up a mobile field camp or like a mobile uh, lab um, and collected samples um, for genetic analysis. Starting in the field, obviously these samples are coming out of very dirty environments, probably the dirtiest environment that can be imagined, right? They're coming out of, out of soil sediments and, and dirty caves that birds have nested in. I mean, it's just like a mess, right? We have time slices. We've got a 3,000-year-old slice, and then we've got a 2,300-year slice. 
and then we've got a 1500 year ago slice and then we've got modern people and what we're looking is you know we can look at the transformation of the genetics over that time frame and there are very few other places where you can look at an ancient DNA record that tracks that much time we can look at population history in a way that is just you know it's it's not unique but it is one of the first projects that really looks at this in a great in great detail and instead of looking at a few markers from many individuals we looked at whole genomes from a few individuals. And that, that allowed us to make some really powerful inferences about the ancestry of individuals from the three main archaeological um, horizons. Yeah, I mean, these people were adapted to it. That's the most interesting part, too. They have the genes. Each one of them had either EPAS-1 or EGLN-1, so they were fully adapted to high elevation life. But what we found was genetically these people are, are almost certainly coming from the Tibetan Plateau. They look very similar to present-day Tibetan populations. When we think about evolution and we think about you know how have humans evolved, there's a few cases in which the evolution seems to be quite recent. Um, one of those is this high altitude adaptation. And again, however, what we found was genetically they were very, very stable. So here you had a, a almost you know genetically stable population with massive cultural and social change that happens, and that's uncommon. You know, we're, we're exploring our common humanity here, and I think that's something that we don't do enough of as, as human beings in many cases. We far too focus on our differences, and I think that what archaeology provides us with is an opportunity to look at differences and similarities across our evolutionary time. I think that's a better answer to that question about why is this important. Well, it's important because it tells us something about us. The good news is that when I look back now on my career at this point, I would say I'm really glad that I did this. I can't think of having doing, doing anything else with my time. Thank you so much. All right, we'll talk to you again. Thank you. Have good luck day. again, okay? Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.